What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We're getting right back into Team Outlooks. As you know, it's Team Outlook Thursday. We're doing two teams today, the Broncos and some other team from the AFC West. After this one, I'll get it out. We hit the AFC East already. We hit the AFC North. So if you missed those, go check them out on my channel. We're doing all 32 teams, of course. If you're looking for a specific team or player, just go to my channel. Type in that team and you'll find it there. You'll find any player relevant to fantasy within that video. Also stay tuned because my draft guide will be dropping probably within the next two or three weeks. That'll include top 250 rankings, sleepers, busts, rookies, basically everything I've been putting out on my YouTube channel. It's like a one-stop shop for all that stuff. If you can't get around to watching it all. But let's talk stallions. So one of the more interesting battles that we'll see throughout this summer is the quarterback battle here in Denver, right? As a first round pick, Paxton Lynch, you know, the Broncos obviously want to see him under center. They want to see him become a starter for them and see him become like a franchise player, you know? But that spot belonged to Trevor Simeon last year. Surprised a lot of people. And looking back on it, all things considered, I think Trevor Simeon did a really good job as a quarterback for the Broncos. So when I say all things considered, you look at their O-line, they were really bad in pass blocking. You look at the rush game, he had almost no support, right? They averaged 3.6 yards per carry, which was tied for 28th in the NFL. Now, Simeon played in 14 games. He averaged 243 passing yards per game, put up an 18 to 10 touchdown to interception ratio. Nothing crazy there in either of those statistics. And you might want to write him off as like a game manager, right? Like an Alex Smith type of guy, but that simply just wasn't the truth. He wasn't just throwing dump offs. He wasn't just throwing easy, short, over the middle kind of kind of stuff. You look at his average depth of throw, it was 9.2, which was ninth in the NFL. It was ahead of guys like Aaron Rodgers, ahead of guys like Matt Ryan, ahead of guys just like Andrew Luck. And obviously anyone could just throw it like that. It tells me he's not afraid to take chances down the field. It tells me he's not afraid to chuck the ball. He's not afraid to make those tight corner throws or anything like that. He's not just a simple game manager is the point I'm trying to get across here. And given the supporting cast that he has around him, I think it's a good combination for success if they let him continue as a starting quarterback. Now I said the O-line was bad, right? What changes did they make? Went out and grabbed Ronald Leary from Dallas, Metalik Watson from Oakland, and they used their first round pick on this kid, Garrett Bowles, I think the name is, from Utah. Widely considered this year's best tackle prospect comes with a lot of concerns, uh, but it's it's good additions to this team. They're all questionable at best to see if they can really provide a good improvement on the line, but if nonetheless, you know, there's major upside in this offense with these, with these additions. So, you know, training camp wise, they said Trevor Simeon's going to take the first team snaps on like the Thursday, followed by Paxton Lynch on Friday, and new head coach Vance, uh, Vance Joseph, along with new OC, Mike McCoy, who was here in Denver a few years back, they're not gonna have a quarterback decision made yet. They're gonna let these kids split the first team reps. I'm hoping Simeon wins the battle because I think he'd be a more effective fantasy quarterback for the weapons. Obviously, if Paxton Lynch becomes the quarterback, he has a scrambling asset to his game, which could be more effective from quarterback position, but I'd rather see Simeon as the quarterback for the weapons. Going into last year, there was, you know, the questions of Trevor Simeon, Paxton Lynch, Mark Sanchez, whoever. We didn't know who was going to be the quarterback, which led me basically to own zero shares of any of the weapons on this team. You know, given what I just kind of said about Simeon, how I think he, he is a, a good fit for this team, I probably will own a couple shares of Emmanuel Sanders, possibly Demarius Thomas. He's going a little high for my liking, but year over year, you know, they're going the same ADP spots, even though they're producing good numbers year over year. So it's not like it's not like they're you need to spend huge capital in order to get them. So Demarius Thomas finishes wide receiver 15 in PPR, wide receiver 18 in standard, Emmanuel Sanders right behind him, wide receiver 20 in both formats. So Thomas is going off the board right now as 28th overall, wide receiver 14. Emmanuel Sanders is 30 spots later. 58 overall wide receiver, 29. I'm not going to be reaching for Thomas because on a points per game basis over the last few years, his numbers have per, have dipped pretty dramatically. He plays in all the games. So overall, his numbers are going to look good at the end of the year. But on a points per game basis, he's really not that effective. He's not one of those wide receiver ones that you could trust on. I don't want to use my third round pick on him. I mean, obviously the argument for Thomas is easy, right? 90 plus receptions. 1,080 receiving yards in five straight seasons. But he's seen a decline in receptions, receiving yards, yards per reception, 100 yard receiving games, receiving touchdowns in each of the past three seasons linearly. So like I said, on a wide receiver 19 on a points per game basis in PPR, wide receiver 24 in standard last year. 
you know, if you're drafting inside the top 30, top 15 at his position, you're, you're almost taking him at his ceiling considering, you know, they don't throw a ton of passing touchdowns in that offense. And I don't expect that to be the case with, you know, the quarterback questions there. He turns 30 this year and it kind of feels like he's lost a step. You know, those days where Peyton Manning was there and they were setting up tons of screen plays for him where he would catch it behind the line and be able to break off for 60, 70, 80 yards. Those days are behind him, and I feel like that's still kind of factored into his ADP just because people like the 90 receptions, 1,000-yard floors. When you have the same production, basically, from like a Golden Tate who catches 90-plus balls every single year, but he's going 20, 30 picks later. Both of them have very little touchdown upside. When you look at Emmanuel Sanders, on the other hand, I, I actually like him a lot more, right? He's the team's number one deep threat. He's a lot more versatile, I would say, than Thomas, and I think he's a better fit for whoever plays quarterback there. You know, he should still see between 120, 130 targets in 2017, like he's been seeing the previous years. And, you know, there's not many players around where he's going, pick 55 to 60, where you're going to see that opportunity. It's also worth mentioning that Sanders averaged nearly four fantasy points per game more with Simeon under center than Paxton Lynch. We have a really small sample size, obviously. Simeon played 14 games, but he was a lot better with Simeon under center. So Simeon's the guy there. I actually like Sanders as a sneaky play, and I think you know, he never, he'll never get the credit he deserves because he'll never be the wide receiver one in that offense as long as Thomas is there. People don't like the size and stuff like that, but uh, I actually really do like Sanders this year as long as Simeon can get that spot locked up. And when you look at guys after those two, right, they are the majority of targets there. They get almost all the targets. The next most targeted wide receiver on the Broncos last year was Jordan Norwood. He had 32 targets. So between the first two guys, there's not a lot of love to go around there in Denver. One guy I do really like this year is their third round pick. His name is Carlos Henderson out of Louisiana Tech. Same height as Sanders, around 5'11", but he has 15 more pounds of muscle on the frame. Pro Football Focus charted him as the best post-catch receiver in college last season. His shake and bake, gorgeous. You know, he adds a dynamic slot to this offense. A really good return man for their special teams. The targets are monopolized there by Thomas and Sanders. So he won't see a lot, enough opportunity to be a fantasy asset unless, you know, unless one of them goes down with an injury, which is very unlikely because, you know, they've missed a combined two games over the last five NFL seasons. That's a crazy statistic. I mean, if either miss time, I think Henderson can really do some damage. I think it's a good dynasty pickup. I think Sanders and Thomas are both kind of under contract for the next few years, at least. So I'm not sure he takes over that number two role, but you know, the slot role could be, you never know, he might develop that into a position that sees a decent number of targets in this offense. So not on him in redraft, but I will be looking at him in dynasty leagues. There's no one else really wide receiver wise I want to look at. Cody Lattimore dealing with criminal investigation right now. They said he's not even a lock to make this year's roster. So we'll just move on to tight ends. So the best thing Denver could provide to fantasy owners in their tight end slot in 2016 was Virgil Green, fantasy's 42nd best tight end. Now you look at the rest of the Broncos depth chart there, it's filled with, you know, too much buzz, not enough production, high upside, what if kind of players. You got AJ Derby, Jeff Herman, Herman, I don't even know how to say his last name, H-E-U-E-R-M-A-N, and then you have fifth round rookie Jake Butt. So with Mike McCoy running, uh, returning to Denver as the offensive coordinator, you know, the tight end position should be featured or it could be featured in this offense. So it'd be nice if like one of these guys kind of emerged as, as the guy at tight end, but I'm not really, I don't think that's gonna actually happen. Probably better for future purposes than it is for redraft in 2017. I would say the rookie Jake Butt is the most intriguing player on this list, right? He tore his ACL last year though. He'll be nine months removed from the ACL tear uh, at start of the season. So week one's game this year, he'll be nine months removed from the injury. He won the Mackey Award in 2016 as the nation's top tight end. And he was widely considered a first round pick before his injury. So, you know, he's got plenty of talent, plenty of potential and a ton of ability. If they're gonna feature a tight end, I like him for future purposes. Uh, again, this is Jake Butt. So if you're in a dynasty league, definitely someone to keep an eye out for. But I haven't really heard much from the tight end position as uh, as a whole in this offense. I mean, this off season pretty much. So just stay away from the position in redraft leagues, keeper leagues or dynasty leagues. If you're gonna do someone Later in the draft, Jake Butt might be the guy. But let's move on to the position we've all been waiting for, and that is the backfield, the running back position in the Denver Broncos organization. We got a combination of CJ Anderson, Jamal Charles, Devontae Booker, now they just signed Steven Ridley, uh, D'Angelo Henderson, the rookie. Everyone was so excited. CJ Anderson last year went down, right? Knee injury in week seven, people were like, okay, Devon Devonta Booker was already a hyped up guy coming into the season. They thought he could take over the featured back role. 
CJ Anderson got hurt and people are like, licking the chops. They're like, oh man, here comes Devonte. He's about to be a league winner. Proved that he couldn't handle the load. 3.5 yards per carry, rookie season. By the end of the year, the running back workload was split between him and 31-year-old Justin Forsett. So I think that says more about him than anything else. You know, some analysts were pinning his struggles on the fact that he didn't fit well in Gary Kubiak's zone scheme, and he'll, he'll benefit a lot more from the power blocking scheme under offensive line and offensive coordinator coaches Jeff Davidson and Mike McCoy. Uh, the bigger news here is the fact that they just discovered a fracture in Devonta Booker's wrists, which will sideline him for the next six to eight weeks, meaning there is not even close to a guarantee he'll be ready for the season's opener, which will put him very far back on the depth chart. For that reason, they, they signed Stephen Ridley, a uh, one-year contract. Reports are basically saying that there's no way he makes the roster. They just kind of need another body, more competition for the rookie that they brought in, uh, six-round rookie, D'Angelo Henderson. It's gotten a little hype this, this offseason, but what rookie running back does, and he's not going to jump over C.J. Anderson and Jamal Charles. Someone to keep an eye on in terms of dynasty because, you know, if C.J. Anderson disappoints again this year or gets injured, and who knows, Jamal Charles is definitely not like a long-term solution there. That's about all I'll touch on right now in terms of redraft. As far as I'm concerned, this is C.J. Anderson's backfield to absolutely lose. Rated one of Pro Football Focus's most elusive backs over the last two seasons. 2016 was the first in which C.J. Anderson in his career averaged below 4.7 yards per carry. And it was a small sample size. It was just seven games. You look at where they utilized him, right? He played nine less games than Devonta Booker. Still out-carried him inside the five-yard line, seven to five. So they see Anderson as the goal line back more so than they do Devonta Booker. Really, I mean, the argument here is not between C.J. Anderson and Devonta Booker anymore. It's between C.J. Anderson and Jamal Charles or even so Jamal Charles versus himself, right? Anderson's had a tough time staying on the field. Why they signed Jamal Charles, who also has had a tough time staying on the field, right? And now the question is like, can, can the future Hall of Famer, the highest yards per carry ever in the NFL, regain his former self, or even like 75% of what he used to be? Charles has played in just eight total games over the last two years, right? Two serious knee issues, both 2015, 2016, 30 years old, signed to a one-year deal with Denver, zero guaranteed money. That rings a bell. Zero dollars guaranteed. NFL shows no mercy, man. They don't give a f they don't give a fudge what you've been done. So, reports. Reports are saying he has absolutely no limitations right now. He's fully healed from his injuries. Said he hasn't felt this good in a while. No restrictions. He's cutting. He's doing everything. He has zero knee pain right now. Monday morning quarterbacks, MMQB, Peter King says the Broncos want to get Charles 8 to 10 touches a game this year. So, what it, what would that mean, right? Let's Obviously, that's just hearsay speaking from a random guy that just wants to say this, right? But let, let's put this to fruition. Eight to 10 touches. What I looked at is, you know, Mike McCoy is a new offensive coordinator. I believe he'll be calling the plays for them. So he, we actually have a sample size of this because he was the Broncos offensive coordinator from 2009 to 2012. If you look at the running back position over those years, and I took the average because, you know, some of those years were like Tim Tebow under center, some of those years were Peyton Manning under center, so I don't wanna look at like specific years or anything like that. Took the average, the running back position in Denver during those years averaged 397 carries, 69 receptions. Together, 466 collective touches for the running back position. Let's say for argument's sake, Charles stays healthy for all 16 games. It's a stretch, definitely, but let's say he does. If he gets those eight to 10 touches, that would be a minimum of 128 touches. If he gets 10 touches a game, that's 160 touches. So let's subtract those numbers from what we see Mike McCoy give the running back in Denver. That leads to anywhere from 305 to 340 touches remaining, unaccounted for in the backfield. If Jamal Charles gets eight to 10 touches a game for 16 games, what does that say to you, right? Okay, Devonta Booker might not even be playing. First couple games, Stephen Ridley's a long shot to make the roster. And then you have rookie D'Angelo Henderson. How much are they going to trust him touching the ball? Probably not a lot. So that leaves a ton of touches for CJ Anderson to get. He's proved he can be really efficient. He's proved he can be a really good back in the NFL. He just hasn't proved he can stay healthy. So it's almost the same outlook going into last year as it was, you know, it, this year. So when you're looking at the ADPs, right, you have CJ Anderson going overall 65, running back 23 off the board. So in 10-team leagues, that's an RB3. 
in 12-team leagues, it's a low-end RB2. Jamal Charles, overall 144, running back 43. Devonta Booker, 200 overall, running back 53. I am liking CJ Anderson more and more as this offseason goes by. Reports are saying he has a new training and eating regime, which hopefully will keep him healthy. I mean, that's, again, that's just like hearsay. If that's going to help him at all, probably not. But what I'm saying is for the upside that CJ Anderson could have, like I said, 305 to 340 unaccounted touches for in the backfield, even give him... 250 touches, right? Say Booker comes back and gets 90 to 100 of those touches. Jamal Charles has 130 to 160 touches, which is very generous on both accounts. CJ Anderson can still easily put up RB2 numbers. For someone you can get in the seventh round, 65 overall, I'm really, really getting higher and higher on Anderson. It's not like you need to use a fourth or fifth round pick. He's going in the seventh round of 10 team leagues fifth, sixth round of 12 team league. So I think given the upside, given the opportunity that he's gonna have in this backfield, Anderson obviously has a low floor, but he has a lot of potential there. And I don't think people should be off on them just because of the injuries. Of course, it's a huge concern, but you're not paying a crazy price for it. I mean, earlier this off season, the new head coach, Vance Joseph, you know, came out and said, this is gonna be an RBBC, a running back by committee. Quote, you need two or three guys that can carry the load. It's no longer a one guy position, Joseph said. I'm excited to have Jamal, CJ, Devontae Booker, even D'Angelo Henderson in the mix. It's gonna it's gonna be competitive and that's the way it should be. So I don't, like I said, I don't doubt there's gonna be a backfield split. I don't see CJ Anderson getting 300 to 350 touches. Even if JC gets his touches, even if Devontae Booker gets his touches, CJ Anderson has more than enough opportunity as probably the goal line back, as a lot of early down work, he's a good receiver. He has enough opportunity to finish as a high end mid RB2. And you're getting him for an RB3 price, which is probably his floor. You know, and I think people who actually believe that Charles has the same upside that he once had are crazy. You gotta look at it. Coming off two serious knee injuries, he's switching teams, new offenses, he's old. There's other competition there. There's a lot working against Jamal Charles, so everything kind of has to break right in order for him to even provide value in fantasy this year. So I'm pretty much off Charles this year. Maybe if I, if I go CJ, I'll handcuff him, Charles, in like the last round or so, but probably not even. And that's gonna wrap up the Broncos outlook. I wanna end with a question as always. One, who finishes higher? Half point PPR, Demarius Thomas or Emmanuel Sanders? Two, who would you rather have out of these three? CJ Anderson? Spencer Ware, Paul Perkins. Answer those questions below. Give that thumbs up if you enjoyed the video and please subscribe if you're new to the channel. We'll be coming at you for the rest of the off season, including into the regular season with fancy football videos. We're gonna help you win your league. Peace.